Hi, everyone. This is Dory Clark, and we are here with a weekly Newsweek interview show, Better. And our special guest this week is Professor Katie Milkman. She's a professor at the Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania. She is the author of the new book, How to Change, the Science of Getting from Where You Are to Where You Want to Be. She even has a prop for this, which is fantastic. And we are going to be talking about how to make change stick. We all want to be better. We are coming up on the fall. You know, this is, this is the, uh, the start of the academic year, start of the Jewish new year, whether you're Jewish or not, we can all have a new year and we can be a better us. And so we are here to talk with Katie about how exactly we are going to do that. Katie, welcome. And so glad to have you here. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much. So also we have people tuning in from around the world. So please feel free to type into the chat box and let us know who you are and where you are dialing in from, because we want to hear from you and we want to hear what is on your mind, the questions you have for Katie about making positive change. So Katie, the first question that I have at a really basic level, um, I think for most of us, there is uh, a gap between where we want to be and where we actually are. Why is it so hard for us to get there? Why is it so hard for us to actually make the change that we claim we want? Well, unfortunately, uh, we are not built well for making change. And I think, you know, I actually, I study the internal obstacles. There are, of course, a host of external barriers that many people face that make change hard. But even if you have everything in your environment set up and structured, and, and you know, even if you've had all the luck in the world, making change is still difficult because of the way people are wired, the way that we're built psychologically. We uh, prefer to take the path of least resistance and, and stick to old habits, which does not accord well with change. We tend to be what economists call present biased, which means when we're thinking about choices that have trade-offs, things that are good for us in the long run tend not to be as good for us in the short run. And because we're present bias, we overweight instant gratification, the tastiness of eating the pizza or the enjoyment we'll get from sitting on the couch or splurging with our paycheck rather than doing the things that are good for us in the long run. So between present bias and the tendency to take the path of least resistance, um, those are two big ones, but there's other barriers too. So it's not even the end, you know, there's the tendency to um, worry that maybe we aren't good enough, particularly when we're facing a daunting challenge, so we can lack confidence, we're forgetful. Uh, there's just so much that we're up against. Sometimes our social network doesn't support us. Sometimes we don't feel ready to actually make a change and begin. So uh, in my research, one of the things that I have found is really critical is understanding what specific barriers of that long list I just offered you're up against. And then there's different tools that can actually help us accomplish change depending on what things are obstructing us in our path. All right. So that sounds, that sounds daunting, Katie. There's a lot of barriers, but we're going to unpack them today. So we're excited to have you here. And we're also excited to greet some of our special guests tuning in and joining us. We've got Cheryl here from Minneapolis, St. Paul. Anna's here from New Hampshire. Janet's here. Jeff is from Seattle. He says, oh my goodness, you got a fan. I loved how to change. So Thanks for that, Jeff. That's great. Daniel's here from Washington. Pinku is joining us. We have lots of great guests uh, and, and folks who are tuning in. So please feel free to type into the chat box and let us know who you are, where you're tuning in from, and questions that you have for Professor Katie Milkman from the University of Pennsylvania Wharton School. Now, Katie, these days I would be remiss if I didn't ask about the thing that we've all been dealing with for the past 18 months, uh, which is the pandemic. A lot of people had a lot of trouble making change during that time. Uh, some people fell back on bad older habits that perhaps they had shed before. Other people just felt uh, the... the um, the the side what was what was the the phrase your your colleague uh, your Wharton colleague Adam Grant used languishing and so we've been languishing it's a little hard to uh, to change when that happens how has the pandemic affected people's ability to be able to take action and make positive change 
Yeah, I think it's been a really difficult period for making change because a lot of the landmarks that we use to mark time, and I by landmarks, I don't mean, you know, physical landmarks like a rock or a building, but I mean, actually the landmarks on our calendars, the things that disrupt our lives and, uh, and make it feel like time is passing, like taking a summer vacation or taking your kid to school and having a separate weekend relative to the week that looks really different. Uh, those kinds of things, gathering for holidays, when they fell by the wayside, it made time uh, really hard to mark, frankly. It felt like one big blur. And that disrupted a lot of people's rhythms, made it hard to break bad habits because there weren't moments that felt like they stood out from others where you could say, okay, this is a breaking point. I have a new beginning and a fresh start, which is one of the topics I have studied and shown with my collaborators can be really useful in helping us launch change. But we haven't had many of those because, again, all of this has been sucked away. And, and of course, it's just been incredibly stressful and draining. Uh, you know, people are losing loved ones. Um, people are getting sick themselves. And even if you haven't had those awful consequences, you've, you've been affected in, in other ways. And so that stress and sadness, that is a burden that makes it harder to change and harder to, um, you know, mount an attack on something that you've been meaning to do because you feel like just surviving is a challenge, let alone making these changes. So it's been a really difficult time. Uh, when I wrote this book and I was sort of launching it in May, I was so hopeful with vaccines and so many people uh, felt like we were on the precipice of this new era, at least here in the United States, things looked like they were going to be getting get better. But now with this Delta wave, I think there's this new rush of hopelessness that will, you know, will it ever end? So it, it's been a really tough time for making change. I hope that means the evidence and the science on what can work is even more valuable at this moment because we need it more than ever. But, uh, but it's also just, it's hard to find the will inside you to try to launch those efforts. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. We are here with the Newsweek Better interview show. We're talking to Professor Katie Milkman. Her email, her uh, website is katiemilkman.com. You can find out more, learn more about her book. It's called How to Change the Science of Getting from Where You Are to Where You Want to Be. And if you want to make sure that you never miss one of our weekly Newsweek interview shows, you can go to my website, which is doryclark.com, and you can sign up, get a free self-assessment, and you will get regular regular reminders about these Newsweek conversations. And so we have some great questions coming in, Katie. And one that came in from Anna is, is there an ideal moment in our lives to encourage behavioral change? How do we understand when is the ideal moment to do it? If we have been waiting and, and thinking, oh, you know, I probably should, I probably should. How do we, and I know this is something you talk about in the book, how do we leverage some of that to capture the right moment to get momentum for our change? Yeah, it's a great question. and also relates, unfortunately, to the barrier I just described, which is that we've had so few landmarks sort of standing out in time and making our life feel like it had a fresh bit of momentum. And it turns out that the ideal moments for change seem to be, at least according to research that I've done with Heng Chen Dai of UCLA and Jason Reese of Behavioralize, we found that there are moments when we're more motivated to make change and those moments arise at uh, turning points in life, moments that feel like a fresh start or a new beginning. So we're all familiar with New Year's, which is probably the most popular of those moments for people to launch efforts to make a change. But we've actually found that there are other moments that get less attention, but can be very motivating as well, ranging from the start of a new week to the celebration of a birthday, uh, even the beginning of a new season or academic year can be motivating, particularly if we draw attention to it for people and say, you know, when do you want to start pursuing a goal, give them up a, a choice set and label a date, for instance, as the first day of spring, as opposed to the third Thursday in March, we see this giant leap in people's attractiveness or in the attractiveness of that date as a time to start when people recognize, oh, it aligns with a new beginning. And the idea of why that works so well, what we've seen in our research is that you feel like you're turning a new page, opening a new chapter in your life. And you can say sort of the old me who failed to achieve whatever goal it is I want to achieve, you know, they're gone. <laughs> this is a new me. I have a new chapter, a fresh start. I'm more optimistic. And we're also more likely to step back and think big picture about our goals at those moments. So um, I think that that's part of the answer. There's also wonderful research by Wendy Wood from University of Southern California showing that um, when we have actual disruption in our lives, not just 
looking at the calendar and seeing a date that feels like it marks a new beginning, but you move to a new home, take a new job, uh, become a parent, a moment when there's a real transition in, in your routines and habits is a, an opportune time to change in part because uh, you, a, a lot of baggage falls away, right? If you were always stopping at Dunkin' Donuts on the way to work for a snack you regret, uh, and now you have a new commute because you're going to a new office, it's easier to change at that moment. You literally have a blank slate to build from. So if we can find moments that combine the two, that, that seems like the most powerful opportunity for change. A moment of disruption when some of the bad habits or the things that, that stand in your way might be washed away because you've moved or you have a new role uh, or you have an, a new social network, that can be really ideal. Yeah, I think that's really powerful to find ways to actually leverage leverage those disruptions that we experience naturally and use that as a uh, a kind of point of uh, of emphasis so that we can embark upon change. Now, I share your interest, Katie, in questions of how we can actually take humans' natural tendency toward short thinking, short term thinking, and hopefully rewire it a little bit. I actually have a new book that's coming out in three weeks called The Long Game, How to Be a Long-Term Thinker in a Short-Term World. So I have tried to apply a lot of these principles and I really you know, enjoyed your book. Again, that book for any of you who want to order it, it's how to change. There's lots of great strategies in there. But one of the things that I, I think was helpful in the book is you talk about your own personal experiences applying these things. Can you perhaps share for folks who haven't yet read the book uh, an example of a, a challenge that you had for yourself about ways to improve and how you applied your own, you know, how you took your own medicine and applied your own strategies to make this happen? Yeah, I, I, so many times that's, you know, it's funny because I think researchers who study behavior change fall into two camps. Obviously, there's a continuum, but I like to think of us as having sort of two, two um, lumps. <laughs> it's a bimodal distribution. One group of us is like, you know, we have all sorts of problems making change. And so we started doing me search. We were like, what can I do to fix myself? And then there's this other group that is amazingly organized and self-controlled and thinks it's just peculiar that other people have problems and they study it. So it's it's funny to see like, which group do you fall into? I'm definitely in the me search category. Um, my One of my first experiences sort of looking inward and and uh, solving a problem for myself and then studying it was with something I now call temptation bundling. And it was when I was a graduate student and I was I was studying engineering, taking really tough classes that, you know, I'm glad I survived. Uh, and at the end of a long day, I would come home from class totally worn out and I knew I needed to start focusing and doing my homework. But all I wanted to do was just curl up on the couch and, you know, binge watch lowbrow TV or read a novel, sort of indulge in entertainment. I also knew I really needed to be getting exercise to to stay, you know, mentally with it. I was a college athlete. It's a huge part of who I am is to get that physical activity. It's so important to me, but I could not drag myself to the gym. And between all of this, I sort of I had a revelation. I thought, what if I only let myself enjoy that indulgent entertainment after a class when I'm at the gym? What if I try linking those two things? Maybe that would help. And and so I started doing it. I only let myself uh, binge watch TV. Actually, I listened to audiobooks. Also, that was sort of my favorite because it didn't have all the sensory input. So I was listening to the Harry Potter books and Alex Cross series. I would listen to them at the gym during a workout. And what I found is I would come home from class and I would actually crave a trip to the gym to find out what happened next in my latest thriller. And time would fly while I was there because I was I was hooked, I was engaged, it was fun. And then when I came home, I was energized and ready to do my work because I'd gotten that entertainment hit out of the way and I was all revved up. And it was this like magic sauce <laughs> that worked so well for me. And I realized maybe actually this could help lots of people. What I was essentially doing was creating, uh, a, I call it a temptation bundle, making something that used to be a chore that I used to know was good for me in the long run, but no fun in the short run. I linked it with something instantly gratifying and tempting. So it became a pull. And it also prevented me from wasting lots of time with that entertainment when I should have been doing other things. It was it was a sandwich and it worked so well. Um, and I studied it and proved in, in a couple of different experiments that this kind of linkage can help people exercise more. And theoretically, there's lots of ways we can apply it. I started seeing all 
all over my life that, you know, you can only let yourself enjoy your favorite, you know, coffee drink when you're heading to the library to hit the books or only let yourself listen to your favorite podcast while you're doing household chores or drink your favorite glass of wine while you're making a fresh meal. There's all different ways that we can create temptation bundles once we recognize that adding a little bit of fun and making it more instantly gratifying to pursue our goals in this way can add so much value. That's great. So temptation bundling, that's a, a terrific takeaway strategy. In fact, I used to do something similar when I needed to write articles back when I lived in Boston. I would go, I, you, you talked about a, a metaphorical sandwich. I actually had a literal sandwich involved uh, because I would go to my favorite cafe and I would order, you know, the nice, the nice chai and have my favorite sandwich. And I would write my articles and I would basically say to myself, I am not allowed to leave the cafe until I have written the articles. And there were no excuses because there was food and there was drink and there was a restroom and you know, all you're the bribing things you yourself and it yes. used to work. That's it's great. all it's all about the right bribes. That's exactly that's exactly it. So you know that's that's the takeaway, people. Bribe yourself to change. We like it. Uh, we want to greet Deb who's here. Uh, Deborah's here from uh, Williamsburg, and we have Jaya Ram tuning in from India. We have Annette, she's here from California. Uh, oh, Gail is here from North Carolina. So uh, please feel free if you haven't said hi, type into the chat box and let us know uh, where you are dialing in from. We always like to to, uh, to greet you. And please feel free to put your questions for Katie Milkman into the chat box. We want to hear what's on your mind. You can find out more about Katie and her research and her book, How to Change, at katiemilkman.com. And Katie, a question came in. Uh, Anna is very excited about this topic. And uh, I love uh, I love the enthusiasm here. She wants to know, um, how can you identify the whys of change and how can you leverage them? Now, we know sometimes, uh, sometimes why isn't enough on its own, but it can be quite powerful. So how can we harness that better, the sort of reasons why we need to change in order to, to make our efforts more effective? Yeah, it's a really terrific question. Sort of how do you, if you have a long-term motive, how can you make that big long-term motive enough to motivate you to make progress on a daily or weekly basis? There's a lot of really great research on goal setting that suggests it's important to break down that big ultimate goal into more bite-sized components so you can see the progress in a meaningful way. And I think I think that would be one suggestion on the why is, is not only focusing on um, the why of your long-term goal, but also break it down into smaller, more bite-sized parts and think about the why of those so that on a daily basis, when you're doing the small things, you can look up and understand what the big picture is. So, so that's one piece of advice. Um, I, I do think one of the challenges with the why is that uh, present bias means we focus so much more on whatever is right in front of us and the why is tends to be distant. Normally the why isn't because it will feel good today. The why is because in a few years or in even decades it will pay off and get me where I want to be. And so whatever you can do to figure out how to make it instantly gratifying to recognize what the why would be today. I think those things are really, really important. Excellent points. I, I love that. Thank you. Thank you for that. We're here talking about how to make change stick. And we want to say hi to some folks who are tuning in now. Carrie's here from LA. We have uh, Nola from Ontario. We have Carlos from Colombia. This is uh, this is great. All kinds of folks tuning in. Adis from Miami. Uh, we're glad to have you here. And a question came in from Jeff and uh, Vinay seconds it. So we know it's on the minds of the people. They're curious. I, I'm not, I don't know the answer to this, but Katie, by chance, have you done any research? Research about folks with ADHD and how that might impact uh, their their ability to change. Maybe there's some lessons uh, lessons to be learned there. That's a fantastic question. You know, it is not a group that I specifically have studied, but I was just talking to some uh, to a team at Penn actually of, of an MBA JD student who is starting a company that's built around trying to help kids with ADHD study more effectively. And the whole structure of the organization is using an idea that I write about and how to change, which is um, the power of commitment devices and specifically creating environments that are really truly distraction free. 
Um, so commitment devices are tools that we can use in order to um, constrain ourselves so that we won't make mistakes that we, we might be tempted to make um, without those constraints. So we're used to other people imposing these kinds of tools on us, right? Somebody else says, okay, you know, we're gonna have a speed limit and you're gonna get fined if you go too fast, but you can actually create structures and constraints on yourself to achieve more. And the tool that they were creating had to do with um, a, a distraction free study space. And they felt this was particularly important for people who struggled with ADHD, given all of, again, this is not my area of expertise, but it makes a lot of sense logically that the, some of the tools that create constraints that are useful to all of us might be even more useful to um, to this particular population. So I just throw that out there that I think commitment devices might be a particularly handy uh, tool. Yeah, I think I think that's that's great. And thank you, Jeff and Vinay, for that question. So, Katie, something else that I'm curious about. Um, there, there's a, a vogue uh, sometimes when it comes to things like dieting, especially, but uh, perhaps other things around the idea of having a cheat day where uh, the idea is, OK, we can make a change, but it requires a lot of willpower. We have to really, really focus. But maybe one day a week or whatever the interval is, um, we're able to let off steam by just going crazy and doing doing the thing. Uh, I would love to have your perspective. Is this an effective strategy? Is this something that actually is useful? Or is it better if we're really making change to stick to it and stick to it on a consistent and ongoing basis? What are your thoughts about that? I'm going to give an answer that's a bit of a hedge, actually. So um, I, I think uh, I'm not sure the cheat day specifically is perfectly implemented based on the science as is in that um, having that consistency and building habits um, may be pretty important. And so the, the cheat day sort of gets away from that. And if it and streaks seem to be powerful. So if you break your streak, you may sort of throw up your hands and say, oh, what the hell? But one of the things that is really powerful that's quite closely related is some research done by Marissa Sharif, my colleague at Wharton, and also Suzanne Shu of Cornell on an idea that's related, and they call it emergency reserves. So what they've found in their work is, say there's something you ideally would like to do every day, right? Whether it's eating healthy or going for a run or, you know, studying on an app to uh, learn a new language or a mindfulness exercise, whatever that daily activity is that you'd like to do, you want to do it every day, ideally. But you recognize that life sometimes gets in the way. Uh, the problem is if you miss too many days in a row, even, even one or two, you may say, oh, I give up on myself. There's something called the what the hell effect in marketing, where if you have a miss or two towards a goal, you often sort of give up, abandon ship completely. On the other hand, if you have sort of wimpy goals such that you'll never miss, like, oh, I'll just try to do it three days a week, or I'll try to do it four days a week, you're not stretching yourself as much. And we know that tough goals help people stretch themselves. So what Marissa and Suzanne showed in their research is that you can actually sort of get the best of both worlds by using what they call emergency reserves. So they ran a study or a series of studies where they give people a goal of doing something seven days a week, try to never miss. They give them a goal of doing something five days a week, so you can miss twice, or they give them a goal of doing something seven days a week with two emergency reserves. So get out of jail free cards if you had a if you had a miss. Like we won't we won't count it. We'll call it it we'll call it even. Um, what they found is that people were vastly more successful and achieved their goal more regularly when they had this seven day a week stretch goal, but they gave themselves a couple of get out of jail free cards. And they thought it was pretty important actually to call them emergency reserves rather than something like cheat days. I think one of the things they worry about is if you're saying like there's just one day a week when I am going to skip it, that uh, you won't be pushing for the best possible outcome. But if it's an emergency and you allow yourself a get out of jail free card, hopefully most weeks you'll do it seven days. But when true emergencies arise, you, you won't say I give up on myself. So I think there's actually a delicate balance and they've found this really interesting loophole where you can take advantage of all the best behavioral psychology to motivate yourself. And it seems to be every day, but with these emergency reserves for, you know, when you can't lace up your shoes to go for a run because you have a conference or, you know, you hurt yourself or it's just, you know, bad night's sleep, but not, not building them into every week regularly. 
Yeah, that's great. And I have an emergency cat reserve, which I'm <laughs> deploying right as we speak. So I, I, I figure- That's a beautiful you, cat. <laughs> thank you. Yes, I, absolutely. I, I, I have one emergency cat pass per webinar. He just used it. So, uh, so we're good proving your point right there, Katie. That's amazing. Uh, so we're taking your questions for Professor Katie Milkman of the Wharton School, author of the new book, how to change, please feel free to type them into the uh, into the chat box here. I can see uh, your concept you just shared about the emergency reserves. Uh, it is resonating. So Annette, Annette is loving that. That's wonderful. Now, Katie, one thing that uh, that I've heard time and again from colleagues and executive coaching clients that I work with is that certainly when it comes to a business or professional capacity, one of the habits that people are most interested in changing is procrastination. Uh, this seems to be something that you know, you, oh, near universal human tendency. We put things off too long and people really do want to change it. I mean, it's a, it's a stressful position to put ourselves in, but it seems very hard to do it. If you were advising someone who does seem to have a pattern of procrastination, what are, what are the few things that you might say would be most effective to, to get them started on a new and better path? Yeah, this is actually, I'm going to go back to what we talked about when we got the question about ADHD and just go a little deeper into it, which is um, this tool that behavioral scientists call a commitment device, where you create constraints with penalties, essentially, it's sort of the carrot and stick are two tools we can use to motivate ourselves when it comes to behaviors that aren't instantly gratifying that we might want to delay. We already talked about sort of make it fun, temptation bundle, you can, that's the carrot, but you can also use the stick where you actually penalize yourself, you create a structure where you know you will face penalties if you don't achieve goals by say certain deadlines. And research shows this can be really powerful. So um, one experiment looked at students and how they did when they could self-set deadlines with penalties to turn in assignments in class. <laughs> the emergency cat is back. <laughs> yeah, I, I, apparently there's two passes two, today. Two emergency reserves is the right number, by the way, according to Marissa and, and Suzanne's work. So that's, I think that was just a demonstration of what they found. One is not enough. Um, so in this work, uh, students, some students get the opportunity to self-set deadlines in a class, and there will actually be grade penalties if they don't turn in their assignments by a certain time. And other students can turn all their work in whenever they want up to the very last day of the semester. And perhaps not surprisingly, the students who actually uh, had the opportunity to self create deadlines with penalties, many of them took it, recognizing it's important to work, space their work out and having access to such a system improved their performance because they didn't sort of fail the last assignment, which got put off until the very end of the term. So there is some benefit to figuring out how do I constrain myself? How do I set deadlines? And there's some new research showing um, just generally giving people a deadline, say for a medical procedure that they could put off indefinitely. When you give a deadline or just state a deadline, that can be useful as a tool. Now, this isn't at all rocket science, but what I think is really interesting is there are some ways to make it even more effective that we often aren't aware of or don't take advantage of. I'm particularly fond of a couple of different websites that allow you to put money on the line that you'll have to forfeit, maybe to a charity you hate, if you fail to achieve a goal by a certain date, and that can help with procrastination. So stick and be minder are the two I've heard of, but there may be others. And they both basically, you create a contract, you put money on the line, you name a referee who will report to the site on your success, and then you choose a charity you'll donate to, and they have charities on either side of hot button issues. So if you feel passionately about you know, gun control or gun rights, you can say, I'm going to send money to the wrong side if I mess this up, and then it's going to really burn. And that can be an effective tool for motivating yourself not to, to engage in this kind of procrastination. And it's really uh, amazing. Some of the research shows this, how well this works. One of my favorite studies, the randomized controlled trial with smokers trying to quit. And some were given access to this kind of commitment device where they could put money on the line that they'd have to forfeit if they didn't pass a nicotine or cotinine test in their urine six months later. And others just got sort of standard smoking cessation advice and tools. And the quit rate was 30% higher in the group that had this tool to prevent procrastination. So it's a really useful technique that you can layer on top of the more intuitive deadline that you might set for yourself. 
Uh, that's fantastic. I love it. And in fact, stick.com is a resource that I talked about in my first book, Reinventing You. So I want to double down on that. That's uh, very, very useful in terms of finding ways to force yourself to make the changes that we all claim that we want. We have been here talking with Professor Katie Milkman. Her website, where you can learn more about her work, is katiemilkman.com. And her book is How to Change. Uh, it is available now and uh, is an exciting resource for anyone who cares about behavioral change. If you want to make sure you never miss one of our weekly LinkedIn news, Newsweek uh, series, uh, you can go to doryclark.com slash LinkedIn, hit the subscribe button and subscribe to the newsletter there. Katie, for our last speed round question, if you were advising people who are wanting to make a change, but maybe they've just gotten discouraged in the past because they've tried it, they feel like they've tried it a million times and it just has never worked for them. If they say, oh, maybe I'm just not the kind of person who can really successfully make changes. What would you say to them? How would you encourage them to get started so they actually can make it happen for real this time? That's a great question. Uh, you know, there's so many different techniques that I could point to, but let me pick a favorite, uh, which is based on research by Lauren Estris Winkler at the Kellogg School of Management. What she's shown is that actually, if you coach other people, if you give some other people who are looking for advice on how to achieve a goal that you too hope to achieve, by coaching others, you can actually improve your own outcomes because it it makes you um, first feel good about yourself. You realize you must know something and, and actually have something to offer if you're in the position of advice advice giver. It causes you to introspect more deeply about what might work so that you can give advice to others. And then once you come up with those ideas, you're going to feel hypocritical not using them yourself. So I actually have an advice club um, of similar professionals in sort of a similar stage of their careers with similar goals. And we give each other advice. We sort of reach out when we need help. And so you get the social support and wisdom of others, but also you get to be in the position of advice giver, which can help you too. So that might be a, a strategy that would be helpful to people who are struggling a little bit with confidence, trying to motivate themselves to help them recognize how much they actually do know and get them to take the next step. I love it. We learn by teaching others and by sharing. That is great. We have been here with Katie Milkman. Go to katiemilkman.com to find out more about her and her new book, How to Change. Thank you all for tuning in. And Katie, thank you for joining us this week. Thank you for having me. This was a real treat. Take care, everyone, and see you next week.